Thank you all for having me here today. Uh, 2015, Cisco estimates that there will be, in that year, 120,000 times the amount of all written words for all human history produced in the form of data. So it's interesting because what you're talking about data, and it would seem like if there was that much data, we'd be talking about other things. We're creating the problem, it's not solving the problem. And there's an interesting personal anecdote about this. And I think about myself, I look at my biography, I was a doctor and I decided to go to law school at night. Some of my friends said, why are you going to law school? And I said, well, I thought it would give me some skills to solve big problems. And they said, you know what Chico Marx said about lawyers? He said, if you have a big problem, get a lawyer. You're going to have a bigger problem, but at least you'll have a lawyer. So, when I think a little bit about what we're talking about here around data, lots of people talking about data, and then we just discover that that just creates a whole set of problems that we have to solve for. I've been struck today by a lot of interesting ideas, and what I think about is that while we have this great promise in this room, everyone goes home, goes back to the daily job, and they realize uh, the pragmatic realities of life are that there are lots of reasons why we can't do the things that we just talked about today. So I want to spend my uh, time talking a little bit about this challenge of moving from interesting to important. Because what's really going on here in many ways is we see a lot of interesting ideas, and yet when we talk about, well, why isn't this stuff being adopted? Why are regulatory printers not being changed? It's really because we haven't made the transition from interesting to important. And the, there's three specific things that I want to touch on briefly around what makes something go from interesting to important that I think are going to be useful in terms of healthcare. The first is, is there a burning platform and are you addressing it? And I want to talk a little bit about what the burning platforms might actually be. The second is, is, the, um, is that uh, are you, um, is this a, a business, is this idea an innovative idea or is this an innovative business? That's a really interesting and uh, problematic concept because a lot of the things we have make good ideas but they don't necessarily make good businesses. So I want to talk a little bit about that first issue, the burning platform, for a second. Um, there are really, in my mind, three reasons why those of us who run healthcare organizations, govern, governments, can't simply stand still. And the reason I make this argument is that the problem is getting so big that doing nothing is actually going to be an unacceptable problem. And I will describe it in really three areas. And I'm going to give you a little bit more nuance than maybe you can think about it. But it's really because the promise of portability and I'll describe to you what I mean, is such that we simply cannot solve the problems using the approaches we've used today. The second is that the nature of consumers and consumerism are actually changing the dynamics such that we can't solve the problems and we can't address the problems the way we address them today. And the third is that the digital world is coming to digital health, whether we like it or not, and we're going to have to solve for that problem as well. So let me talk for a second about affordability. When I say affordability, I don't necessarily mean that we spend too much money on health care. In fact, I'm not sure that we spend too much money on healthcare as a society. If you look at some of the analysis about economic value, it's probably one of the best return on investments we've got. But I do know two things. One of them is the prices we pay for healthcare services are so high that we're a vast outlier in the marketplace, and that that issue has to get solved. And the other is that the amount of healthcare that we spend that comes out of the public sector is a problem because public sector spending crowds out other public sector needs. And I'll give you an example of that, right? We talk about, well, 20% of the GDP, and that's too much. Here's an interesting observation. If you look at household incomes, the amount of money spent on health and health care, about 10%. But we spend about 60% on entertainment. Now, we don't stand around thinking that that's an unsustainable problem for which we need to have conferences to decide how to stem the growth of entertainment. That's because the government doesn't pay for entertainment. That's because people choose to make more money and spend more money. So in that health conversation, the public spending issue is an important one. And the reason I make that point is because from a government perspective, part of managing the dilemma of the difference between public and private spending, the cheapest way to solve that is for the government, is going to be for the government to make available certain raw material for the private sector to start solving some of those problems rather than keeping that constrained. The other issue is important is the concept of price of services. And, I, and, and this is a really important point. If you actually look at the engine that has driven health care expenditures over the last 30, 40 years. You'll discover, actually, in the U.S., the last 35 years, the increases in prices has represented about 60% of the explanation about why costs go up. If you look in the last 10 years, it's about 75%. If you look in the last three years, it's 90% of the reason why costs go up. 
And if you do international comparisons and you look at things like hospital expenditure, you'll see that we spent, uh, as a country, we spent uh, about 70% more than other industrialized nations do on hospital care, but we consume 30% less. How do you get there? Uwe Reinhardt wrote an article in 2007. It's the price is stupid. We're a two, three, four standard deviation outlier on prices. And as a society, because the cost of prices goes to the price of health care, the price of health care feeds into the cost of labor, and we're in a globally competitive labor market, it's, ab it's absolutely impossible for us to live in that envelope and not begin to address that issue. And what that means for health care providers is they're going to have to figure out how to actually provide a better product while simultaneously accepting a lower price. Now that is a productivity challenge. And if you actually look at industries who solve productivity challenges, one of the main ways they do that is they have to figure out how to take things like labor out of the equation. And they start thinking about how one uses technology to substitute for labor. And how you think about moving work to your customers. And all these concepts which we haven't even begun to touch in health. So that problem is a problem that will ultimately force all of the actors to address because the economic reality, there's no possible way to ignore that problem and to stand still. The second issue is this issue of consumers and consumerism. So a lot is said about this, but here's how, what I think about it. There are basically three converging forces right now. We have a demographic force, Gen Y, Gen X, baby boomers, all the attitudes they bring. Uh, we have a, uh, a prosperity uh, in our society that allows people to have enough time and money to think about things that they want to have on their own terms. And the last thing we have is information and awareness about what's possible. That basically causes people to want to interact with the world on their own terms, not on anybody else's terms. And when we talk about consumerism, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about people who are simply not going to engage on terms that are not favorable to them. And the challenge we have in health is that our model is basically about organizing around how we, how we deliver care, not necessarily how our patients want to consume care. Now here's a place that I'll illustrate where this really matters. Because one of the conversations we're having with our citizens is, are you getting your money's worth for the money you spend on health care? And if you ask, if you look at survey research on what patients value in health care, you find a very interesting answer. About two-thirds will say the following. I don't know what value is, but I know one thing. It's not information about cost, and it's not information about outcomes. It's something else. So what, is that, what could that possibly mean? I think it means a few things. If you look at the body of literature on what patients want, you see that they typically want technical, they want care and they want compassion. The technical care is important, but what the only things they can really judge are whether they're getting compassion. And so what they're really looking for is the ability to understand whether or not that part of their needs are being met. The reason I make that point is if we're going to try to project and demonstrate to our citizens that they're getting value, then we're going to have to figure out what they think is valuable and solve for that problem. So when I say interesting but not important, you look at a lot of interesting ideas that people are putting forward and ask the question, does it ultimately get at what people actually want to have that allows them to understand in some fashion that they're actually getting their money's worth? The third concept is this concept of the digital world. And this is an interesting one because uh, what this really says is that um, there are a series of capabilities that are available to us right now that allow us to do things differently. And we do them differently in every other part of our life except healthcare. Right? We have, whether it's um, technologies like collaboration technologies, uh, we've talked about data plenty, data analytics, but uh, social technologies, social platforms, sensing technologies, you've heard all about that. We have all of those in our outside experiences, and we wonder why they can't be brought into healthcare. I'll give you a, a great example of how this stuff converges in our personal lives and why, why we wonder why it's not in our healthcare lives. So I have two teenage daughters, they're professional shoppers. Has anybody used a technology called Shopkix? Anybody know what Shopkix is? It's a technology, it's a couponing technology, basically. And it allows me, when I'm in the store, to get a coupon for that store at that time. Now, here's the concept. It knows a little bit about something a little bit about me because I've registered. But the other thing is it, it takes advantage of the fact that in the store there is an inaudible sound being emitted that my smartphone is detecting that's registered to that store that associates me with the store with my history, and I get the coupon for the store. Now, that means I get exactly what I need based on where I'm at at the time. Our concept for getting people healthcare information is here is the world's biggest table of contents. <laughs> and maybe you have a semi-smart uh, search engine. 
we don't at all think about, wait a second, I know who you are, I know where you've been, I know what you want. I'm just going to give you what I already know is important as opposed to asking you to go find that sort of information. So we will not, as a society, the voters won't tolerate that gap. It's going to get too big and they're going to force this thing to close. So I actually think we're on the cusp of a bur the burning platform is here. I think that we are just beginning to recognize that standing still is not an option. And I think that that is actually what's going to drive the public discourse around how to deal with things like privacy and uh, all the other regulatory frameworks and all the other sorts of incentives that are out there. The second problem with moving from interesting to important is the concept that these ideas are necessary but not sufficient to get change. So if you think about it right now, there's a lot of really interesting data ideas. But if I'm on the outside and, and somebody's asking me to pay for one of these, my response is, that's, that's cool, but if I just did that, it doesn't actually do anything. There are so many other things that have to happen. This, I think, is one of the big challenges we have with the conversation about data. In reality, data is necessary but not sufficient. Data doesn't contain answers. Data contains information that people use to reach answers. And then ultimately, if you actually look at what people do with that information, they have to take steps. If you look, for example, at private equity today making big investments in areas around consumer engagement and behavioral and, uh, and uh, behavior change, you'll notice that only about one-fifth of the money is being spent on trying to help people understand what they should do, and four-fifths is being spent on tools that help them actually do what they already know they should do. It's not a data problem. It's an enablement problem that they're trying to solve. And so the idea that we had, that if we just had the information, good things would, ha would happen, I think is um, short-sighted. And the challenge is those who, of us who advocate for data liberation and data access can't stop there. Because if we stop there, it's really interesting, but it's definitely not important. The last comment I want to make on this thread of interesting to important is this idea about whether or not this is really an um, innovative idea or an innovative business. Many of the concepts that get put forward by um, interest by entrepreneurs are really couched in a very elegant technology, and that's cool. The problem is that ultimately what changes societies is the use of that technology in a particularly interesting way. And if you study, for example, areas like telemedicine, telehealth, and you look, for example, again, at uh, the two companies that have received the most amount of private, um, uh, uh, private investor funding in telehealth, they're both really interesting businesses that I would argue are about 80% the business and about 20% the technology. In fact, the technology is pretty lightweight technology. But that's not what is interesting. What's interesting is they figured out how to solve a problem and they used a little bit of technology. Necessary but not sufficient, going back to my first uh, concept, but really it's about the business. So as I, as, you know, if, as I put sort of my owner investor hat and I listen to these ideas, I'm constantly asking the question, that's interesting, but how does it actually create a business? And if I can get my head around it, I think that we then can start to make some forward progress about knocking some of these barriers out. When people ask me how do you get adoption, my answer is people will adopt things that they ultimately think will create greater benefit than harm. The challenge is we haven't crossed the Rubicon. Regulatory construct, regulatory frameworks. Ultimately, regulations are a product of governments. Governments are a product of people and people's will. I lived through the 1990s, where people thought we would solve the healthcare cost problem by forcing people into gatekeeper networks. Guess what? They revolted. They revolted in the public sector and the private sector, and laws were passed to make that not possible. So as a society, if we think it's important enough, the regulations will follow. When I look right now at the issue, for example, of privacy, which comes up a lot in this area of health data, to me, what we fundamentally have not solved for is it's a, we, have to meet, we have to meet our stakeholders on two dimensions. One dimension is trust, and the other dimension is the value they receive for, for offering that, that information. And in any other part of our society, once we manage to cross the trust and value model past a certain point, think e-commerce, credit card purchases, people put their credit cards in. They even put their credit cards in knowing people are going to hack the system and get their credit card data out because there's enough value received for the risk on their, uh, on their behalf that they're willing to do it. So to say people are not willing to provide their information is actually wrong. We have, that's, we've already proven that's not true. What we haven't proven is that what they're going to get is going to be sufficient. And what I think 
is interesting right now about our dialogue is that many of the things that we're focused on are really useful for those of us who produce care, but they don't actually create benefit for the people who consume care. And so we have this very interesting problem, which is that we're stuck living with a regulatory and political framework because voters aren't interested in solving our problem because we haven't figured out how to convert that into an answer for their problem. And in, in, in some ways, until we get our head around the fact that we have to figure out how this creates a benefit for another person, not just a benefit for us in our venture, we're really not going to be able to get past this point. I'm looking forward to the afternoon because I think that there's going to be some interesting ideas there. I think that uh, I'm very optimistic, but I'm born optimistic, but I'm also a pragmatist. And I do think that uh, really forward progress requires us to have big dreams, but to make little plans. And at some level, we're, if, if we can get that balance right, we're going to make forward progress. And I'm going to enjoy the ride with all of you. I've been doing this. I was born in a hospital. I've been in healthcare my whole life. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to the next 50 years, which my kids think since I'm more than 50 thinks is a problem. Um, and uh, thank you for having me here. Thank, thank you. you.